morning. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to Wallace Presbyterian Church. Would especially like to welcome Reverend Cynthia Williams, who's joining us today in uh, Dr. Phil's absence. Um, it's always nice to have uh, Cynthia with us. Remember this morning we will receive the fifth Sunday building offering. Um, we use that to maintain the church physical plant. Um, and a reminder, the, the church office will be closed tomorrow in observance of Memorial Day. And finally, a reminder that next week is Pentecost Sunday, so be sure to wear red in honor of Pentecost. Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord rules, let the earth rejoice. Let all the islands celebrate. The heavens have proclaimed God's righteousness and all nations have seen God's glory. Rejoice in the Lord, righteous ones. Give thanks to his holy name. Please stand for our first hymn, hymn 450, Be Thou My Vision. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him might not perish, but would have everlasting life. Confident in God's infinite love for us bestowed upon the entire world, let us confess our sins together. Gracious power, you call us to your everlasting springs to be drenched and reformed 
but we fail to heed you. We do not turn with love to our neighbors, to ourselves, or to you. Forgive us for our failings, shield us from our due, and guide us into unity with all for the sake of the whole world. Lord, hear our prayers. In the compassion of the God who prays for us, with us, and in us, for the sake of the one who was sent to show us the face of love, and who died and rose one with the Father and with us, may we know that in Christ Jesus, our Lord, we are forgiven. You may be seated, and Carol was going to be leading the children this morning in our message. So if they will come on down to the front of the sanctuary. even longer than it would take sin if I were to tell you uh, because I'm 75 years old and for 75 years you know what God has been taking such good care of me God has I grew up in a little town in California named Arroyo Grande and we had a church just about this size and my favorite time of the day was the children's sermon and when I come here I am so happy because I get to see the kids having a good time having a children's sermon. But you know for 75 years, God has had me in his hands and I am so thankful because he used his hands and he brought me here to North Carolina. And he uses his hands every day to hold me and to take care of me. And this morning, we're going to sing a special song. We have a special accompanist over there. And <laughs> we're going to sing, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. And any parents who want to come up during the last verse and sing along with your kids and hold their hands for a little while, you are certainly welcome to do that. Okay. I have to have the, my, this is my cheat sheet. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the tiny little baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here in his hands. He's got everybody here. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. And now for a little travel time, if any parents want to come up and sing with their kids, please come up right now and come on. Do you want to stand up and hold hands with your family? Oh. 
praise God that he does. Let's have a little tiny prayer at the end of that wonderful message. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us. We thank you for taking care of us. We thank you for knowing what we will do next and watching over us. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Holy God, whose voice is heard in the thunder and in the silence, speak to us now by the power of your Spirit that we may hear your word for us today. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Our New Testament lesson today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of div divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While, the, while she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves to the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and they are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into the prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. After midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymn hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he, had, he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for the lights and rushing in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up in the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. Our gospel lesson comes from the book of John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I am in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see glory which you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The word of the Lord.
God with you this morning. There's a lot of good people in this church, and it's always a pleasure to see you again. Let's try and get things where we're going to sound good. Um, but I'll be honest and say that preparing a sermon this week has been as hard as it has ever been for me to prepare in my life. Um, so it's in God's hands, and let us have a word of prayer to that end. The Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So a few years ago, there was a commercial that played on television. And you know how it is with commercials. They often reveal more truth about us than we care to admit. The commercial featured a wedding scene, bride and groom standing at the front of the sanctuary, the bride's side of the congregation, the groom's side of the congregation, and then someone stands up with their smartphone in the aisle in the middle of the service and proceeds to take a picture. Someone from the opposite side of the aisle yells at that person to sit down and put their big phone away which proceeds then to create back and forth about the different phone platforms that each side of the family possesses, which unleashes then all manner of chaos and a brawl ensues, and it's total madness as they are fighting with each other. Meanwhile, two ushers are standing back observing what is going on with yet a third smartphone platform, which I will confess that in the time since the commercial was made, it no longer exists. But in the moment, the two ushers wonder aloud, if they had this phone, would they stop fighting? And together they say, nah. <laughs> because sometimes people just like to fight. In that moment, years ago, that commercial was funny, but I don't know that it would be as much so now. But it speaks to a larger truth, that we are prone to attach our identity and sense of self-worth and meaning to our own versions of truth, be they devices we carry in our hands or something else. We attach ourselves to narratives that are too small, and limiting and are not genuinely life-giving. And maybe even at times we will go to war with each other over these views. When I don't preach every week, which is common in retirement, I look ahead at the texts and begin to ruminate about them each day. And I watch and read the news and pay attention to what is going on, searching for relevant meaning in the texts to what is going on in our lives. The texts in this season since Easter in the church year are all seeking to help us understand what it means to be Easter people and how, in the words of the poet Wendell Berry, we are to practice resurrection. So what does it mean to practice resurrection? When one nation can invade another and seek to destroy their entire culture and everything that exists, unprovoked and with impunity. I thought that was bad enough. But then in less than three weeks, we've had innocent people gunned down on a Saturday afternoon in the aisles of their local grocery store just for being a different race of people. And then we had Taiwanese Presbyterians assaulted and attacked in their own congregation, having a after-service fellowship time by a person who isn't Taiwanese, Presbyterian, Chinese. Or then there was the stories of leaders of the largest Protestant denomination in the United States calling women who have spoken out and challenged clergy for abuse they've suffered and that their friends and peers have suffered for decades, accused by the leadership of that denomination of being agents of Satan. I kid you not, that's what they said. And accused these women of simply wanting to sabotage the mission of the church. 
All of that following politicians who want to criminalize women for seeking to exercise their personal health care decisions and control of their own bodies. Or then now this week we have an 18-year-old who buys two military assault-style weapons and 1,657 rounds of ammunition and proceeds to murder 19 children and two teachers. All while law enforcement is dithering outside in the hallway trying to figure out what to do, and politicians dither at press conferences refusing to accept responsibility, and people in authority have the temerity to tell people who are outraged at all of this to shut up and get out. So what does it mean to practice resurrection? More thoughts and prayers? So I'm struggling to know what difference it makes to stand here today and what temerity it takes to even think that I can proclaim God's word and I'm humbled by the task and feel inadequate. C.S. Lewis wrote a little book several years ago entitled The Great Divorce. If you've read it, then you know the story. In it, he paints a picture of heaven and hell. Hell is a city on earth shrouded in a constant fog and mist and rain and cold and dreary. The center of the city is empty, devoid of human life. And going out from the center are other concentric circles, going further and further away from the center, each of them also empty and devoid of life because humanity can't stand each other, and so they flee out from each other to get away from each other. But they're given an opportunity to escape hell and go to heaven. They can get on a bus and go to heaven and see what it's like, and they can decide to stay. Only they can't stand it. Heaven is luminous. Everyone that is there is shining with light. They have significance and solidity and the grass hurts the feet of the people who've arrived and get off the bus from hell, and they can't stand to see who's there that they knew on earth, and they can't stand the agony of any process of transformation they need to undergo to stay, and so they choose to go back and stay in hell. It's more important to them to be right than it is to be able to enter the reality of heaven, and they'll live in hell to prove it. And such people just make life hell for everyone else. Jesus fully understands, as he prays with the disciples, in the last hours of his life, the challenge of the transformation to which he has invited them in the course of their ministry, which is not yet completed, and what they have yet to undergo. It's an invitation that Paul articulates as no longer being conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of your minds. The word repentance in the Gospels literally means to change your mind. These words in John are Jesus' prayer for his disciples, understanding full well the challenges they are about to face. In all the Gospels, Jesus brings healing and new life to people, but he also brings controversy and conflict. Plots begin almost immediately to silence and to kill him. Jesus' own disciples are conflicted amongst themselves. What do his words mean? Who will be first? Who gets to sit on your right and your left, Jesus? And selfishly, they compete for the seats of privilege and power, right up until the last minutes. You're not going to wash my feet, Peter says to Jesus. By the time the Gospel of John is written, it is some 50 to 60 years after Jesus has walked on earth. The early church has struggled and is struggling with full-blown birth pangs 
as it seeks to understand its purpose and its mission and presence in the world. We read these stories in the book of Acts, Peter going to the house of Cornelius and Gentiles receiving the same spirit of Jesus as Jesus of, as the disciples. Greek converts complaining of being treated as second class citizens and new orders of authority and ways of meeting people's needs are established. Saul being part of house to house searches for followers of the way of Jesus to persecute them and execute them only to convert to being a follower of the way. And Paul and Barnabas, just a few verses before what we read today, are not getting along with each other in their mission journeys and they decide to travel and work separately. So it's not easy following Jesus. And it's not simple. In the literary context of today's prayer that Jesus utters, it's just before his arrest and crucifixion and all the chaos it will unleash in the disciples' immediate lives. And then in the historical context of the gospel itself, as all this turmoil I've described, as the early church takes shape and finds its footing, and then in the current context, the one we live in, for which Jesus is also praying, he wants us to know this. I'm not only praying for my disciples, I'm praying for you. All those who will believe in me because of the witness of my disciples about me. The goal is for all of them to become of one heart and mind just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. So that they might be one heart and mind with us. And then the world might believe that you in fact sent me. The same glory you gave me, I gave them, so they'll be as unified and together as we are. I and them, you and me. Then they'll be mature in this oneness and give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and loved them. Loved them in the same way you've loved me. The truth is we're much more aware of what divides us than what unites us. And I don't even need to begin to list them all because you're aware of them. You know too well what they are. When John speaks of the world and his gospel for which he's praying, on one level he means the institutional expressions of power that we create. And the world we've created thrives on division instead of what unites us. Journalist Davis, David Brooks lamented Friday night that he felt a rising tide of menace in our society. People are feeling emboldened to bully and intimidate those with whom they disagree. And not only that, but see those with whom they disagree, not just as having a different opinion, but actually being evil and are described so. People are beginning to think nothing of threatening violence to members of election boards, school boards, flight attendants, health department officials, physicians and nurses, civil servants doing their jobs. Meanwhile, pundits and politicians and lobbyists sow seeds of suspicion, enmity, conspiracy, and I'm gonna tell you it's every bit built on lies. There isn't an ounce of truth in it. All of it used to stir fear and rage in people's hearts, and the dividers are literally laughing all the way to the bank. They are no different than pushers on the street corner seeking you to give, give you a false high of identity rooted in fear and animosity. It stimulates like an airwave form of meth laced with fentanyl and just as deadly. But you go ahead, if you feel lucky, take another snort, turn on your favorite social media hit of hate and see if you can escape its grip. Because you know what addicts all say, 
It's not me that has the problem. It's you. We get a tiny glimpse of the world's narrative in this story in Acts. Paul and Silas are in Philippi having success proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, converting households. And as they spend their days walking the streets of the city, going to places of prayer, this slave woman, used by men, they've bought this woman and they've used this distorted sense of power that they perceive her to have to profit off of her as a fortune teller. But she's been following Paul and Silas and yelling out loud all day long, these people are servants of the Most High God. I struck by the translation that Hayes read because he used the word slaves of the Most High God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation to you. Now, just imagine how annoying that was to have this woman following them all day, yelling this everywhere they went. But it wasn't unusual, if you read the Gospels, for the demon-possessed to see and state truth that others refused to see. It's annoying Paul. And I have to be honest and say, what he does next is not born really of altruism. He turns and says, in the name of Jesus to the Spirit, leave this woman. But today I would imagine him saying, Jesus Christ, woman, shut up. In the name of Jesus, leave this woman. And instantly she was free. Maybe for the first time in her life. God worked through Paul, whatever his intentions and emotions in the moment. She was free free of men who use her for their own profit and prestige, free of being property of someone else, free of men who claimed power over her by saying she was worthless and it was her own fault that she was worthless. Her only worth was in what they could get from her. Free of what had tormented her, free to be united with a community and a life to have a life. Because where the spirit of Jesus is invoked, people are set free. Where the people, where the spirit of Jesus is invoked, people are set free from all the names and claims that others impose to limit and impoverish and demean and diminish them and deny their humanity and their worth. People are set free to live into their true identity as children of God and not who the world tries to name them. Needless to say, her owners are not pleased. They're going to lose some money now. They drag them to the marketplace, to the authorities, but they don't accuse them of disrupting their income source. They accuse them of being subversives, out to destroy society. They are not one of us. They're Jews. They're not Romans. So they're stripped and beaten and thrown into the deepest, darkest part of the prison in shackles and chains. And yet at midnight, at the darkest hour, we find Paul and Silas praying and singing hymns, and it's earth-shaking. The prison is opened. The jailer who has put them in chains and locked them away is terrified for his life and seeing his life now as worthless because his whole identity and job and income source as being the jailer is now suddenly jeopardized and he's going to kill himself. But they stop him and he says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust him, not the authorities who made you a jailer. And he takes them home, bathes their wounds, and they bathe the jailer and his family in baptism, and they receive the spirit of Jesus, and they all sit down and break bread together 
around a common table. Because where the spirit of Jesus is invoked, people are set free. The poet Wendell Berry says that there are no sacred spaces and unsacred spaces. There are only sacred spaces and desecrated spaces. And desecrated spaces are anywhere you refuse to acknowledge the presence of the holy. And since God is everywhere all the time, there is no place where God is not. All ground is holy ground. Paul describes this vision and the purposes of God in Ephesians. In Jesus, God has torn down the dividing walls of hostility that we erect to separate ourselves from each other. Sin and sacrilege then are revealed in the erection of raw walls and creating division. For Jesus is our peace, our wholeness, what unites us, creating in himself one new humanity instead of two. In other words, there can't be any outsiders in the world that God creates. So that then we are a household of God, might grow together into a holy temple and a dwelling place for God. God seeks to make his home in us that we might make our home in God. Or you know those verses in Galatians. Paul says, as many of you who were baptized in Christ or clothed in Christ, there's no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know those passages in 1 Corinthians 12, just as the one body has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. For it is the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Jesus prays for unity, but he isn't praying for unanimity. He isn't praying that we lose our individuality or distinctiveness. It doesn't mean we stop having differences of opinion or that we become mindless clones or show cult-like allegiance. He is praying that we be united in the larger narrative and promises and reality of God. For in Jesus, the kingdom of heaven has come to earth. And God's home is among mortals. Jesus is fully one with God and God with Jesus. And as Jesus is one with us, we become one with God. It is an intimacy a relationship, like breathing. In Genesis, the Spirit of God moves over the chaos and God's breath, spirit, ruach in the Hebrew, pneuma in the Greek, the source of all life, the breath of life, has come to us in Jesus that we might be able to remember who we are and whose we are. What does it mean to be Easter people? What does it look like to practice resurrection? There's a story that you may have heard, maybe Phil has used it in a sermon, of an African concept called Ubuntu. An anthropologist had been living with a tribe in Africa for a period of time, and he was constantly surrounded by children everywhere he went, and he would give them candy and other treats. And on his last day, as he was waiting to depart, he had some things left, and so he decided to play a game with the children to give out the last of the candy. He would have them run a race, and he told them whoever won the race would get all of the leftovers that he had. Winner take all. So he traced a starting line in the sand with his shoes, and he took a basket and placed all the candy he had left at the base of a tree, and they had them line up behind the line he had written in the dirt, and he said, go. And they all joined hands and ran together to the tree. And then they all sat down together in the shade of the tree, sharing the candy with one another. Well, he didn't expect that. So he asked one little girl why they had done that, and she said, how can one of us be happy if all the others are sad? That's Ubuntu. 
Desmond Tutu says, a person is a person through other persons. My humanity is caught up and bound inextricably in yours. How can I be happy and whole if you are deprived and cheated? How can I be free if you are oppressed? Jesus has come that we might remember who we are and whose we are, that we are part of a larger narrative than the ones we create for ourselves or than the world seeks to impose on us, that we are all created in the image of God, and that we are created for relationship with God and all of creation, not just the parts of it we like, not just the places we feel comfortable, not just the ones who look like us, think like us, live like us. Our identity as God's beloved is a free and merited gift that like breathing we can receive and release, but we cannot possess it or control it. Hold your breath long enough and you'll just die. Jesus told Nicodemus at the beginning of John that the wind blows where it will. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. All we can do is breathe. And here's the thing about the narratives of division. They only fill us with fear, not breath, not life. They constrict our vision and our imaginations. And when you are afraid, it's hard to breathe. We are united in our universal need for the breath of God to give us life. There is a purpose to Jesus' prayer for oneness. It is that by that very oneness, the world might see and know God and believe, which is to trust the deeper connection to God. And the deeper our connection to God, the deeper our connection to all humankind. For God so loved the world. Love is the demonstration. Love is what makes God visible. Jesus' prayer isn't just for the disciples, it's for us. The goal is for all of them to become one in heart and mind, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. So might we be of one heart and mind, that the world could believe in you, in fact, believe that you sent me. Nancy Adler gave a TED Talk that I saw online she tells the story of her great-grandmother, Nina. In 1939, in Vienna, the family needed to get out of Austria because of the rise of fascism and Hitler. They had four exit visas, but there were five members of the family. So her children had decided that they were all going to stay if they couldn't all go. And she said no. If we all stay, we all die, and our family will cease to exist. So she persuaded them to leave. Ten years later, Nancy says, Nina's granddaughter gave birth to her. And Nancy says, without a love connected to a larger narrative and purpose, she would never have existed. There's a lot at stake right now. The world is hungry and desperate to see and witness and receive the love of God. And I don't know that we're doing enough. I know we can do more. What does it mean to be Easter people? And what does it look like to practice resurrection? We need to be engaged in conversations to figure that out. God loves us. Let us honor that love. Amen.
For the prayers of the people today, I have taken a prayer from the Presbyterian Outlook that they have written for the denomination to use. Let us pray. God of grace, we lament the violence. For those who have no words, those holding themselves rocking with each wave of grief, those planting both feet seeking balance in crisis and chaos, those who moan, weep, and wail the names of their dead, those sitting silently in front of their screens sickened by the shootings, by the innocent lives lost, by the hatred that fuels such violence. God of grace, we remit, lament the violence and we pray to you. We pray for the victims in Buffalo, in Laguna Woods, California, in Uvalde, Texas. We pray for those terrorized and traumatized by horrific shootings. We lament for the lessons the shootings teach us over and over about racism and hate, undeniable and unrelenting and so costly. We pray for the people of color who pay the price for that hatred day after day, year after year, century after century. We pray for our Taiwanese siblings in California targeted during the violence at Geneva Presbyterian Church. We pray that your people find comfort in your saving grace. We repent that the children of this nation and their teachers continue to pay the price of our worship of violence and our indifference. Lord, have mercy on us. May your presence be palpable in Texas. Our land is troubled and our peace disturbed. God of love and life, guide us by your truth. Bend the arc of the universe towards justice. Inspire us with courage to resist the evil of racism, to proclaim your inclusive love, to root out the enemies of righteousness, to persist for peace. Let nothing move us from your path of love, blessed God. Let nothing sway our confidence that you are with us. Turn our eyes to Christ and the promise of redemption. Pour out your spirit upon us again and help us to breathe the good news of your love to everyone we meet and keep alive within us the prayer you have taught us to pray together saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are God's beloved. Let us give thanks for that truth with your tithes and offerings.
God bless these gifts to empower and equip this congregation to be your faithful witness in the world. May your love shine through them as they have received it. May all the world know the truth of your glory and love. We pray in your name. Amen. Let's affirm together what we believe by using the words from the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 451.
we are. To go in confidence of that truth and live into that truth and seek to better understand what it means to practice resurrection. And the peace of God be with you. Amen. Thank you.